Hey guys, welcome back. So today I brought home this 5,000 watt Husky generator. Uh, this one I found on Craigslist. It was listed only at $150. And according to the description, it has a good running Subaru engine, but the power head doesn't make power. And more often than not, when a generator doesn't make power, it's usually a fatal problem in that power head. So don't pay too much for one of these. You know, in my case, I actually have another generator with a blown Subaru engine and a good power head. So worst case, I can take two bad generators and make one good. It may not come to that. You know, this could be a simple problem. I'm not sure. But visually looking at it, it's in very good condition, except for the wheels. They are quite rusted and the end cover as well. So I'm guessing moisture got in there and probably caused an issue. So I'm gonna start by getting that end cover off. I'll take a look visually, see if there's any obvious signs of a problem. Uh, but before I do that, I just wanted to thank Ken from Ken's Small Engine. Uh, due to the pandemic, I actually wasn't able to leave my house for a while. So I messaged him, asked him if he would pick this up for me. And not only did he do that, but he talked the seller down to 80 bucks. So not a bad deal. Thank you, Ken, for that. Anyway, let me set up a little bit better and get going on this. I pulled the AVR out of the way just to get a better look at the windings, and I don't see any red flags here. I mean, the copper color looks good. None of the lacing is broken, so no obvious signs of a problem here. I'm going to break out the multimeter. We'll do some more digging and see if we can't get to the bottom of the issue. There's a lot of corrosion down here on these terminals, so I'm not sure I'm going to get a good consistent reading. Instead, I'm just going to use these pins on the quick disconnect. We've got two black ones on this side and two white there. And then the middle is the ground. Usually they wire this in such a way that leg one is diagonal and leg two is the other way. So let's see what we get. Usually 0 0.3, 0 0.4 is a good reading. And we're at 0.3.4 on leg one. So that's good. Let's check the other leg. We're at 0.3.4. So it actually seems like the stator is good. Let's just check each one to ground. That seems to be good. We'll check leg two. Yeah, so it appears the main windings are good. Let's just check these other two sub windings here. We've got these two blue wires that's called the DPE winding. That's what supplies power to the AVR. Usually, you know, 0.5 to about, sorry, 1.5 to about 1.9. And we're at, oops, looked like we were at two. One point nine. I think that's good. Let's check it to ground. No connection. And then we have a green and a white. This is the sense winding. It's what the AVR uses to 
determine what voltage the generator's at. And usually that's about 0.2 ohms. Point two, point three. Seems good. We'll check it to ground. And no connection to ground. So the stator actually appears to be good. Uh, let's check the rotor through the brushes, which is going to increase the resistance. But if I were to go directly to the slip rings, this rotor should be between 40 and 70 ohms. Uh, but through the slip rings, it is going to bring it up maybe to about 200 ohms, potentially. And I get nothing. So either we have a bad set of brushes or we have a bad rotor. So let's get those brushes off and test directly on the slip rings. The brushes visually look to be fine. Let's just check the ohms real quick. Seems fine. It's hard to get an accurate reading, but I saw 13 ohms flash on the screen for a second. I'll check the other brush. That's also fine. That's actually quite a bit lower. We got three ohms there. But regardless, we got nothing when going through the brushes to the rotor. So let's see what happens if we go direct. And there's nothing. So yeah, the rotor is bad. And that might actually be a good thing because I have a lot of extra rotors. I don't know if it'll fit this stator. It has to be exactly the same length as the rotor that's in there. So I need to get the stator off, get the rotor off, and see if I have one that's compatible. Before going any further, haven't actually heard this engine run, so I'm gonna check the oil real quick, try starting the engine, and make sure that it sounds good. Oil looks pretty clean, and it's full, but it does look cloudy. There might be a bit of water in there. Let me show you. Hopefully that shows up, but it's not really the color I'd expect for good oil. Uh, I'd say there is a bit of water in there. Not a lot, but it is enough to change that color of the oil. So usually I wait to run the engine. I make it earn an oil change, but in this case, I think I'm gonna change it. I'm glad I changed that oil. It doesn't look right. You know, there is some contamination in there, most likely a bit of water. Anyway, let's see what this engine sounds like.
okay, not too bad. The engine sounds very good. The carburetor definitely has issues though. It took a good four or five pulls to get the engine started. And then once running, I turned the choke off and the engine went to stall. So put the choke back on halfway and things sounded pretty good. So I would say we have a good engine, a dirty carburetor and a bad power head. So I'm gonna work to get that power head off, but before I can do that, I need to get the tank out of the way. And the tank is full of fuel. So I'll drain that out, get the tank off, and go from there. Gonna drain the carburetor first. If there's water in the oil, there's a good chance to summon the fuel, and that would definitely make it hard to start. Yeah, there's water in the fuel. I'm surprised it started at all. Anyway, I'm sure there's more in the tank, so there's no question that fuel has to come out. There wasn't as much fuel as I thought in that tank. You know, the first bottle that came out is clean. No water to speak of. So that is good fuel. Uh, the second one, not quite as good. I'd say it's about 95% fuel. But right down there on the bottom is water. And the last bottle, definitely the worst. I'd say 90% water and just a little bit fuel right on the top. So that fuel is still good. I'm gonna pour that off into a separate tank and all this stuff at the bottom, that will get recycled. Anyway, the tank, it is mostly empty at this point. There's still a little bit in there. So I tilted the generator away from the fuel outlet and I'm just gonna mop up what's left and then we should be good to proceed. That stuff there is the reject.
This one put up quite a fight. I thought I was going to break the end housing trying to get the ball bearing out. Uh, there's a lot of rust here that was kind of holding it in place. But now that it's out, I can tell this bearing is shot. It's very crunchy and making a lot of noise. So that would have to be replaced if this rotor was good, which it's not. Uh, usually these don't melt down, but the wire does tend to break between this terminal and where it goes into the main coil. And in this case, don't see any breaks. Let's see if this connection is good here. Seems fine. Let's check the other side. Wire looks good. We'll check the terminal. And that is a broken solder joint. So that's an easy fix. This can be repaired. But since we also have a bad bearing, uh, let me check my other rotors. If I have one that's compatible, I'll go with that. Otherwise, we can just repair this. Okay, good. This rotor already has threads and it's an M12 1.75. So there's two ways I can use this bolt to get the rotor off. First would be to put some Teflon on here, tip this up vertical, fill the shaft with water and just twist the bolt down. It'll build hydraulic pressure and push it right off. You know, in this case, the bolt that was in here is a pretty thin diameter. And there's a lot of extra room. So I can put a rod down the shaft, cut to size, and essentially do the same thing. So you just need to get a measurement of where the bolt hits the crankshaft and mark it. And then you need a rod that's a little bit less than that long, about a third of an inch less. And I've got some pre-cut from other projects. And this one looks to be the right size. So I'm going to use this one to push that off. The bad rotor is on the left, the good on the right. This is also from a Husky generator. It's from an HU5000, which is the same series generator, just a newer revision. Uh, visually, you can tell there are differences between these two. The newer one has a plastic fan, and the permanent magnet is on the opposite end. Now, I don't know if that's going to cause an issue with the unit powering up. It might, but in order for this to have any chance of working, the dimensions have to be matched. And I've already checked the width. It's a fairly standard size. We're good there. The length is critical. If there's a difference, then the brushes won't line up and the ball bearing won't seat properly in the end housing. So I already marked on this drill bit where this one exits. And when comparing it to this other rotor, it's really close. I would say within a sixteenth of an inch, possibly an eighth. So this might work. It might not. But it's so close. I think the only way to know for sure is to install it and see where things line up.
Gonna tighten the rotor to 23 foot-pounds, but I need to lock the engine up. And usually what I do is rotate the engine so the piston's at the bottom of its travel, fill a cylinder with rope, and that essentially locks things up. But in this case, I can just remove the recoil, put a wrench on it to hold things still, and then torque down on that rotor. I think that did it. The stator went on without issue and seated into the bell housing and the ball bearing looks good as well. So I'm gonna install the brushes and just double check the alignment on those slip rings. That alignment is dead on, so I think this is going to work. Now's a good time to pull the engine over. You wanna make sure that rotor is not scraping on the stator or even worse, the engine binding up. Anyway, the spark plugs are moved, so there's gonna be no compression fighting me.
Interesting. Not sure what to think of this one. The engine turns freely. I don't hear scraping. And the engine's not binding up, but there is this odd squeal. And that could be a sign of an issue. Uh, in this case, I'm not sure. So I'm going to give this one a bit of thought before moving on. I wasn't sure what to think of that noise, so I ended up pulling off the stator. Really just wanted to look for any rub marks, and I'm not seeing it. You know, it looks pretty good. Same thing with the rotor. The interesting thing, though, is that now that it's uninstalled, that noise is gone. So there clearly was an alignment issue. I'm going to pause it here, reinstall the stator, see if it's any better. Glad I took that stator off again. It wasn't right, and now it is. It was actually quite a bit easier the second time since that ball bearing was freed up, but I made a rookie mistake. I took it off with the brushes installed, and this is what happens when you uninstall a stator with the brushes attached. Usually the brushes break right down here. In this case, the plastic housing broke, but that makes me wonder, was it the brushes somehow squealing on the slip rings? I'm not sure, but I'll never find out. I'll start by giving this a new set of brushes. connecting up the brushes it is polarity sensitive and these usually it's the left terminal that is positive and in this case it's red and it's marked with this little tag here with a plus sign
And that's it for now. Theoretically, this should make power, but I've never combined two different power heads before, so it is a bit of an unknown. So let's get it outside, start it up, and see what happens. Not exactly the nicest day for this, but I need to know. So let's get it started. The good news is that rotor works fine, but I'm only getting power output on one of the legs. So if I'm lucky, there's a bad connection. Otherwise, the stator might be bad. I'm gonna start by testing the resistance in leg one and leg two. I'll also check here on the 240 outlet and see where we're at. So it is higher, you know, down at the stator, it was 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and through the outlets, we're at 0 0.7. Let's try the top one. And about the same on the top. Let's try this one. It's open circuit. open circuit, and then we'll check it through the 240. The neutral is right here, and then leg one and leg two are on each side. So we got the 0.7 over there. And open circuit again. So this leg is definitely dead, at least up here. So I'm gonna unplug the quick disconnect again. We'll check it there and just make sure that the stator didn't melt down. All right, let's check both the legs from the quick disconnect. We're at 0.4 on leg one. in point four on leg two. So I don't need to do any more tests down here. I can tell just by the way that this tested, there's no issue with the stator or this wiring. The issue is inside this box right here. So I'm gonna get it uninstalled, get it opened up on the bench and figure out what went wrong.
Well, there's your problem. Somebody unplugged the wires from this circuit breaker. There are two breakers on here, one for leg one, the other leg two. And with that one unplugged, you're not gonna get any power to that leg. And that's what we're seeing. One of the outlets is dead and half of the 240 is dead. So it's probably as simple as plugging those wires in. You know, why somebody unplugged it? I'm not sure, but my best guess is when this stopped making power, someone tried opening this up. And if they didn't unlatch this properly, they would not have been able to gain a whole lot of access. And they probably just peeled it back. And the first thing they could reach is that circuit breaker. And they just ripped the wires off and probably gave up at that point. So yeah, let's plug those wires back in, reassemble this and test it again. I'm tempted to just throw those wires on and call it good, but I have it open and I have the multimeter. So let's just check the resistance real quick. Circuit breakers should have a very low resistance. I'm guessing 0.1 ohms, somewhere in that area. So let's see where this one's at. Twenty one ohms. That's way too high. Uh, let's check the other one. Just see what that one's at. Point three, point two, point one. Yeah. So that circuit breaker, I think, is actually bad. So I have one that is rated the same. So I'll get this one out, put the good one in, and throw this back together. I'm gonna steal the fuse from this panel. It is a 20 amp fuse, just like this one. And this actually has the exact same connector on the back as this. So I could just plug this in and use this panel, but I did test the pin out and it is different. So plugging this one in may not be a good thing. So I'll just steal the fuse and stick with this one. I stand corrected. The bad fuse is actually a 25 amp fuse, which is good because the one I just pulled out is also a 25 amp. And because I'm extra paranoid, I'm gonna check the circuit from start to finish. So I'm gonna probe here on the quick disconnect one of the legs. It's either the, the black wire or the red. I'll start with the red. We're at 0.1 ohms. That's good. Let's check the black wire. 0.1 ohms. So we're good.
And that should do it. Both the 120 outlets should work as well as the 240. The only other issue that I'm aware of that has to be dealt with is that carburetor. The engine does not run well when the choke is off. So let's uninstall that carburetor, get it up on the bench and clean it up. <laughs> no air filter. actually looks pretty good in here. So these Makunis, they run them quite lean on the Subarus. Most likely the pilot jet is a little bit clogged and even when fully clean, they still hunt and surge a bit. So I will clean that jet aggressively and hopefully that'll solve the issue. And this jet, it does not unscrew. It's actually just pressed in pretty loosely. The issue is getting it out. You can't just twist it out. Sometimes you can grab it with pliers. And this one's pretty loose, so I think it might come out. But there is a hole right in the center. So if this doesn't work, you can get a wood screw and just drive it in there a bit. And that'll kind of grab it and let you pull it out. Yeah, that's pretty dirty. You can see some gel on it. So that is definitely the issue with this one. That's pretty much it on this carb. Really nothing else comes out. There is a pilot adjustment right here, but you can't remove it. I've tried. Usually it just breaks off. So... Don't try to remove it or you will lose what little adjustment you have. This jet is clogged solid. So I'm just using a wire from a wire brush to kind of poke through. There we go.
And that is pretty much it. The only thing left really is the emulsion tube. And that is a press fit on this one, unfortunately. So that is not removable. Anyway, let's get this soaking in the ultrasonic. cleaned up pretty well. You know, the inside actually wasn't that dirty to begin with. And the outside, really what you see here is just corrosion and that the ultrasonic is not going to clean off. Anyway, let's get this back together. I don't stock a lot of parts, but I do stock these filters for the Subarus. Often, I see them missing, I'd say about 50% of the time. Anyway, you do oil these filters and squeeze out the excess. I just used motor oil. Uh, Subaru actually recommends three parts diesel to one part oil.
I ended up pulling this panel off again. It was bothering me that this outlet was still testing high at 0 0.6, 0 0.7 ohms. So I replaced the other fuse. So now both fuses have been replaced. And now when I test, I get the readings that I expect, which is 0 0.4, 0 0.3. And same on the other side. So now they're matched. So what went wrong with these fuses, the original ones, I don't know. But I'm going to take the worst of the two, just drill out the rivets and take a peek inside. It's not too bad. I was expecting worse. There's a little bit of green where there shouldn't be, but it's not terrible. Anyway, these circuit breakers are pretty simple design. It's just power in, power out. And the current, it travels across this bimetallic strip. When too much current is going through, this heats up and it deforms and it opens the contactor down here. And I can actually see that is dirty, has a bunch of corrosion on it. So that, I'm sure, is why the resistance is high. It could be cleaned up, but I've already replaced the other one with one that hasn't been exposed to the elements. So I'm going to leave good enough alone. But, you know, I wouldn't say this is junk. It could be salvaged. Anyway, I'm going to apply a bit of heat to this. I just want to see it in action, see if it still works. And it does. You see the contactor opened up and it's still open, but when it cools down, it'll close or try to close the contactor just like that. Uh, but it can't actually close the connection because this is still out. And when it's in that position, there's a piece of plastic separating the top contact from the bottom. And when you reset it, you're essentially sliding that piece of plastic out of the way, resetting the spring and restoring that connection. Even though I already swapped out the rotor, I am curious if this one can be saved. I know the ball bearing has to be replaced, but there's no point in that if I can't get a good connection back to the slip ring. So I'm gonna to try to reflow this and double check the resistance to see if this rotor has any chance of being used in the future. Yeah, it's not sticking. I'm going to try to clean it up, use a bit of flux. Still nothing. So it's not a great connection, obviously, but it is stuck to the terminal. Two point seven million ohms. Better than zero, but that is not good. So I yeah, I don't know what I'm doing wrong here. It has a connection. It's almost acting like 
the varnish on the magnet wire isn't scraped off, that plus the solder really is not sticking. You know, I'd say there's a ton of flux on there, not so much solder. So I'll try this a little bit longer, but yeah, this is why I don't try to save rotors. Float everywhere except on the wire. Seven million ohms. No good. Nothing. So either I don't have the right tools or the talent, but there's still no connection. And the solder's actually sticking well to the terminal now, but it absolutely will not stick to the wire. It's repelled by that wire, which might explain why it let go in the first place. I think there might be a bigger issue with this rotor. I'm just trying to scrape a clear spot of copper here on the wire and test from the wire to the other side. It should be around 50 ohms. I really can't get a reading even remotely close to that. <laughs> well, that's why I can't get a good reading. The wire had weakened so much that it was ready to break in another place. So, do we have enough left? Yeah, there is something wrong with this rotor. The enamel, when I scrape it off, you can see it's not a copper color anymore. I would say this is most likely aluminum wire. And although I did get a reading at one point in the millions of ohms, I can't even get that now. So yeah, this rotor, I think it's done.
And that's pretty much it for right now. I want to get this outside. We'll get it going. Make sure that both legs are making power and go from there. All right, let's give this thing a cold start. And by cold start, I mean really cold. It was actually the coldest day in about a year this morning at negative five Fahrenheit. So let's get it started, see if the carburetor is doing a better job and test the output on both of the legs. And if things are good, we'll load it up and see if things keep working the way they should. Choked off under a load. All right, not too bad. It started second pull, and the engine sounded good, at least. For a few seconds i did have to partially choke it to get it to smooth out and we're getting power from leg one and leg two so we're doing pretty well now the engine speed and the voltage they were low without a load i think we were just at about 60 hertz 117 volts so i brought the engine speed up to 61 and a half hertz loaded it to 3000 watts and the engine speed held just fine at 60 and a half hertz and the voltage right around 100 and 17 volts and under load I was able to turn the choke off things kept running just fine until I took the load off so that pilot jet does need a bit of attention it's pretty typical on these Makuni carbs a lot of them do surge without a load so potentially it might need to be drilled out but before I do that I'm gonna pop the AVR off I want to bring the voltage up a bit to 120 volts if not a little bit over
Usually one full turn clockwise will bring the voltage up about 3 volts, uh, but not always. Sometimes it's counterclockwise and sometimes a turn will bring it up 20 volts. So I started at half a turn and we'll see what we get. Yeah, half a turn clockwise brought this one up 10 volts. So I'm going to bring it back halfway to where it was, and that should land us somewhere around 122 volts. So I'm going to leave it where it is. It's at about 123 volts. And I actually set the potentiometer back to where it was. So I find that kind of interesting that setting it back where it was now results in the right voltage. But I think maybe the, uh, the contact in that potentiometer could have just been a little dirty. And by moving it and setting it back, we're now getting the expected voltage. Yeah, I'm kidding. I'm not going to use this, but I do have another. I went to the Ryobi website for something else the other day and noticed they were selling these for a dollar and 30 cents each. So I picked up a bunch. So it looks like I can get the pilot jet out without removing the carburetor. Maybe. Yeah, that one might be the winner there, number 78. So the 80 and 79 fit, 78 does not. So I will drill it out with that.
But before you do that, make sure you can get a replacement jet. Sometimes you cannot, in which case you might be in trouble because if you drill it too much or if the drill bit breaks, then you need a new jet. And this is a very small drill bit. They do break. Uh, in my case, I do have an extra jet, so I will give it a try. There we go. Tabby. Yeah, unfortunately, drilling that jet one size up had no noticeable effect. So I could keep going, but I do have another Makuni carb that I think is in good condition. So let me dig that out, take a quick peek inside, and if it looks good, we'll just swap the carbs. Yeah, I think that'll do. I'm also going to swap out the air boxes. The one that was on here, the gasket stayed with the carburetor, and this extra has the gasket already on it. amazing 
the difference a good carburetor makes. This engine, it's now running very well, both with and without a load, and the generator is doing exactly what it should. You know, going into this, I expected I had to replace that power head, and I kind of did, but not quite the way I thought it was going to turn out. Luckily, I have a bunch of extra rotors. One of them happened to be compatible with that stator and brought this thing back to life. Granted, I did have a bit of a scare when one of the legs was not working, but as it turns out, it was a bad circuit breaker. Both those have been replaced, and this is now a good working generator. So I hope this video helps someone. Thanks for watching.